Okay, um, in the next topic, um, we shall be discussing that how a company can calculate its probable beta, even though the company is a unlisted private company. So sometimes what happens is that a company is a private firm. It's not a public listed firm. So the stocks are not traded in any of the stock exchange. But the company could be interested in knowing the fact that what if I were a listed company, what would have been my beta? If I ask you that if you look at Nokia, Finair, these kind of big companies, Microsoft, Apple, Walmart, you can easily calculate their betas, or you can see the headline beta published in the uh, very popular websites like Bloomberg or, or Reuters or Yahoo Finance and whatnot. But imagine a small company in US Kula, a small SME, a startup, and the company wants to know that imagine I become a publicly traded firm, what would be my beta looking like? And even further, the company questions itself that I want to find out what would be my levered beta and at the same time, unlevered beta. So if the firm, it's like a what if analysis. You know what if analysis? It's like, what if this happened? What if that happens? How the numbers would, how the world would look like? It's like a simulated beta. They want to find out that what would be their simulated beta look like, all right? So in that case, we use a, an exercise, we use a skill. The skill is that we pick up some legend companies. Legend companies. The legend companies are those companies which are big listed firms, but they are in the same business, in the same industry. So for example, if there is a small, um, small IT firm in Uvascula, then the legend companies could be Apple or Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you can see the name of the firm is Too Soft Firm. Have you heard about Too Soft Firm? Don't you know about it? Are you sure? Just Google Too Soft Company. There's no such company. I just made it up. So that shows that this company is, is known to nobody. So you are a small firm. All right, but you want to find out that what if I were a listed firm, how would my beta look like? And even further, how would the unlevered beta look like? So in that case, what we do is that we find out the, the legend company. So like in this case, uh, I'm taking this example of a private IT firm, and I'm taking three uh, legend companies, Microsoft, Oracle, and Adobe Systems. And these betas are either you calculate by yourself or what we call them as headline beta, the published beta, they are here. And at the same time, you need to find out D and E, debt to equity. These are the numbers in the absolute amount I'm taking in, in, in dollar billions, for example. So you can see that they are in the billions, they are dollars, they are, this is debt, the finance debt, and this is the equity of the company. This is the input data we require. And then we also get some more information that, uh, full screen, let's see the full screen. That the risk-free rate is 4%, right? This risk-free rate would be common for all the, the, for the whole country. Uh, the market portfolio uh, is the risk premium Risk premium on the market portfolio is 8.4%. Uh, the corporate tax rate is 34%. And let's assume that CAPM is true. So our, this model, this calculation is based on capital asset pricing model. Uh, debt is risk-free and all those assumptions. And now we need to find out uh, levered and unlevered beta of this company called Too Soft, which is a private firm, maybe a small firm, maybe a startup, maybe just on at the idea stage. And your task six is exactly based on this work.
Okay. Why can't I off here under this? So you can see that this formulation, Microsoft, Oracle, Adobe system. Can you see what I've done here? I was given Microsoft's levered beta, which was 0 0.75. Was it? What I did was I used this formula Unlevered beta is equal to levered beta divided by and all these things. Remember we discussed last week, right? So what I did was I applied this formula here. And what I get is I get unlevered beta of Microsoft 0 0.73. Now, please somebody tell me what is the interpretation of unlevered beta? Your levered beta for Microsoft is 0 0.75. The unlevered beta of Microsoft is 0 0.73. What does it mean? This is the 0 0.73 is the unlevered beta, which is a systematic risk measure if the company has no debt. So imagine Microsoft's debt becomes zero, then 0 0.73 would be the beta of Microsoft. Okay, which is good. Yeah, of course, debt adds to the risk. Yeah. But remember, this is not a real beta. This is a hypothetical beta. This is scenario analysis. This is what if Microsoft has no debt. But the fact remains that Microsoft has debt. But this is like a scenario analysis. What if there's no debt? Well, uh, it depends upon the amount of debt you have. Uh, if the amount of debt is huge, then the difference between levered and unlevered beta would be huge. The difference between levered and unlevered beta depends on the quantum of debt the company has. If a company's whole capital is 10% financed by debt and 90% by equity, then that would be hardly indifferent. But if the company has 40% debt, 60% equity, then when you discount 40%, your unlevered beta would fall a lot. Right? Make sense? And the same technique I use to find oracles. Now I'm not writing, I, I'm leaving it blank, but the formula is given above. So if you use this formula uh, and you apply uh, oracles beta, levered beta was one actually. So it's if it is one, uh, divide by all these numbers, you can find out that 0 0.84 is Oracle's debt. It falls from 1 to 0 0.84. Doesn't mean that Oracle has a lot of debt. Yes, Oracle has. See, if you compare Microsoft and Oracle, uh, Oracle has big, big chunk of debt. I would say, in this case, uh, for Microsoft, debt is only uh, one twenty fourth of the equity here it's almost one third right and this is why this is why the oracle's unlevered beta is much lower than one okay and then the same thing you do for adobe systems uh, adobe systems beta was 1.08 and they also have a lot of debt almost one fourth or less one point third something one third um, and you find out that the adobe's beta is 0 0.92 it also falls substantially and then we find the two soft companies average the average of 0 0.92 84 0 0.84 0 0.3 so when you find the average 
you get 0 0.83. This is the unlevered beta of two soft company, which is a single, maybe one room company, some small IT company, um, very local level, very, very small scale. As I said, maybe a startup or a company only at the idea stage. And then we want to find out the why, why, why TrueSoft is interested in calculating its unlevered beta and levered beta. Well, the levered beta is straight away. If you want to find the average, if you want to find the levered beta average, look here. I found the TrueSoft's unlevered beta. Yeah, but if you find the average of these betas. That would be two soft companies levered beta. All right. So that is also possible. If you find uh, 0 0.75 plus 1 plus 1 1.08 divided by 3, you can get the levered beta of two soft. Or you can do this process and calculate Microsoft's, Oracle's, Adobe's unlevered beta and then find the average. That would be uh, that would be two soft companies unlevered beta. So basically, you can have levered and unlevered beta of two soft companies. If you use the CAPM, you see that CAPM. See, I, I think we still haven't answered this question. Why two soft is interested in calculating its betas? Because the company wants to calculate what if it has to borrow money in the market from the if the company chooses to be a public company and wants to issue its shares to the shareholders, to the public investors, how much it should provide them minimum rate of return that they agree to invest in the company. You know, CAPM sets the floor. CAPM sets the minimum rate of return, which you must expect. If your actual return is less than CAPM return, you rather not invest. So what kind of a kind of guaranteed or a floor rate of return you should give to your to your investors? Well, uh, use CAPM. If you remember, this is risk free rate plus beta. Which beta is this? Unlevered beta plus what is this? Risk premium. Remember, remember it was 8.4%. Risk premium is RM minus RF. Risk premium is always the market return, which is RM minus RF. Remember, this was the formula of CAPM. So RM minus RF is risk premium. In this question, it's 8.4%. And when you put these numbers, it comes out to be 10 0.97%. 10.97%. It means that if two soft company wants to be a public listed company with zero debt, all equity financed, then the minimum return that it should give to its shareholders is 10.97%. All right. On the contrary, if two soft wants to have debt, it, it wants to be a levered company and imagining that the company's leverage will be the average leverage ratio of three legend companies, right? In that case, your beta will not be 0 0.83, your beta will be 0 0.94, which is average of these numbers. The average of these numbers is 0 0.94 because these are levered betas. Levered betas give you levered average. And when you put it, it comes to be 11.89. It means that if two soft company wants to become a public listed company with debt, then the minimum return it should assure to its investors is 11.89%. And you can see the difference. The leave, with, with levered beta, the CAPM return is higher. With unlevered beta, the CAPM return is lower simply because levered beta is more, more risk, more risk follows by, followed by more return. Therefore, with more beta, you need to give more return to your investors. With less beta, you give them 
less return. Simple. So the company, now this company, this, this is very important because last year we did a project. What happened that a startup company came to us and it said that it wants to borrow from the market. But it doesn't know because different bankers are, are offering different rate of interest. So in that case, I, I deputed my two students from, from Russia and they found the legend company. The most complicated job was to find those companies which are big, listed, but at the same time, you fit into their profile. So the profile matching was is the most complicated job. In this and we did it. We got five different companies in Finland, which where that company's profile was fitting into. And we used those legend companies data. And then we forecasted or estimated that this company, if it becomes a public listed company, it should be giving this much return to its investors. All right. So what, what you do? Uh, a private company have no beta. The private company may be having, having no debt. It's all money finance. All the money is given by the, by the entrepreneur himself or herself. But you can do the role playing. The role playing is that you start assuming that if I become a public company, how much uh, rate of return I must provide to my investors. So you just kind of, as I said, it's a hypothetical, it's a notional beta. It's not a real beta. But it helps many small companies to, uh, to, to, to position themselves in the market even though hypothetically, this is all about this. Okay, so we, we carry on. Uh, the next subtopic in this, uh, this main topic, your main topic is that how the leverage helps to make a corporate valuation. Um, how do the corporate tax rates come in the picture? Tax rate is very important. Tax rate can have an impact on the company's value. The debt interest payments are tax deductible. Do we all agree with this statement or not? The debt interest payments are tax deductible. Do we all agree or not? First of all, what does it mean? Secondly, do we agree or not? Hmm? I repeat, debt interest payments are tax deductible. What does it mean? It means that you borrow debt. The, um, the money that you borrow is called debt, basically. And what do you pay on as it's servicing is called interest or finance cost. Finance cost or interest. Is interest tax deductible or not? I remember once upon a time, I showed you an income statement of a firm and you saw by yourself, if you remember that the company pays tax after it has paid interest to its debt holders, but it pays tax before it pays dividend to its shareholders. Do you remember or should I give you, should I show you an example? Do you remember or should I give you an example? Please say me loud and clear. Should I? All right. Now, what we do here, I can show you the income statement of a company. Let's say I show you the income statement of. Uh, income statement of marks and spends. Let's say financial statements. Uh, financial statement of marks and Spencer, which is a popular retail store in, in the UK. Uh, downloads, hopefully, I think we can get here. Full full annual report last year. There we go. It 
it may take some time, but uh, almost there. Consolidated income statement, there we are. Yeah, uh, let me double check if this is even visible to you. Um, yeah, I think that's visible. Okay, have a look at, uh, don't look at the numbers, that, that doesn't make any difference. But look at the uh, the corner, those particulars like revenue, operating profits. All right. Uh, have a look at the have a look at the profit before tax. Hmm? And just before profit before tax, you see finance cost. Do you know what finance cost? Finance cost is basically your interest cost. So you have paid interest. Before you pay tax, look, tax is seven. Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a note. Tax is 125.4 million pounds. But before you pay tax, you have paid already interest. So what is left after paying tax? 455.5 million pounds. This, out of this money, you would pay dividends to shareholders. Remember, money comes. Financing is where money comes from. Money come from debt holder and shareholders. To debt holders, you pay interest or finance cost. To equity shareholders, you pay dividends. Dividend, you will pay out of this money, which is calculated after you pay tax. But to your debt holders, you have paid interest before you pay tax. In other words, your interest payments are tax deducted. There's no tax on interest rate payments. Whereas there's a tax on dividends. Because dividends are calculated after you pay tax and interest you pay uh, before you pay tax. This makes tax, this makes interest uh, tax free, corporate tax free. So basically, I, I can argue that the, the state uh, is giving subsidy on the interest payments, whereas no such subsidy exists to the shareholders. Do you agree with me or not? This goes to the, my statement that the interest payments on debt are tax deductible. There's no tax. Hmm? Agree or not? Is it so that anybody among you is still not able to get what I explained here? Do, you all, do we all agree or not? Okay, great. So this was everything I wanted to show you. So the debt interest tax, uh, uh, sorry, the debt interest payments are tax deductible. Uh, as I said, observe some financial statement. Um, you can take any company in the world, it will be like this. Um, now, don't you feel some kind of favoritism to, to debt? When you see that the interest is given before tax is paid, dividend will be given after tax is paid, do you find some kind of financial discrimination that debt is treated, um, debt is given some prefer preferential treatment over the equity? Visibly, yes. Visibly, yes. Imagine I get my salary from one company and it says that, hey, I give you 3,000 euros a month uh, before tax. It means that I still have to pay tax out of this. Right? And the other company says, we give you 3000, but don't worry, we have cut your tax already. <laughs> so that 3000, the second one would be better than the first one. All right. So even though the amount is same, but it's not same. 
Uh, is debt financing a cheaper source of funding, financing for firms' investment when compared with the equity? Well, apparently, yes. Uh, what about the distress cost? Distress cost. There is always uh, there's always a cost benefit analysis. Now I, I want to I want to put an artificial uh, and hypothetical scenario in front of you. If you think based on the example I showed you of Marks and Spencer's income statement, it doesn't mean that a company should. Okay, let me be sound more cynical. I show you this statement once once again, once again. Imagine a company replaces its equity with debt endlessly. It means the, the Marks and Spencer's equity shrinking and debt is rising because of this kind of advantage which debt has. And what advantage? Advantage is that interest on debt is given before tax is paid. Whereas the dividend to the shareholder is given after tax is paid. So it means that the investor would say, hey, why don't you? Why don't why don't we all get this benefit of beneficiary? Why don't we all become beneficiary of tax treatment? This motherly treatment given to uh, equity and this favoritism uh, for debt. Uh, a corporate finance manager could start thinking, hey, why don't we replace all equity with debt? So have less equity, more debt. If you have more debt, more interest, more interest means less profit before tax. Less profit before tax means less tax to the state. Don't think from a very patriotic point of view. Uh, think from the company's point of view. If a company has a euro, it would prefer to give to its investor rather than to the government. So when you are giving more money because you borrow more, then this amount will be more. Then this would be less. If this is less, then tax is less. So we can be tempted to believe that debt is cheaper and it's better to give to borrow more because then we give money back to our own investors, tax free. So the company can think can start thinking on the lines of endless leverage. But there is a problem. It doesn't go like this. If this is the advantage, if tax favoritism is an advantage, then the cost is that if a company goes for more and more debt, it invites financial distress. The financial distress is that the probability of company will be getting bankrupt increases. If the company doesn't exist, then it doesn't matter uh, whether you have any tax advantage or not. So if the company is getting more and more debt, it would be having more and more uh, debt, interest, payments, tax, deductible. But at the same time, the company is, is inviting a problem. The problem is that the probability, the likelihood, the chances that this company would be bankrupt go up. Because if you don't generate enough cash flow, to pay interest plus the principal to its investors, its debt holders, eventually the company would be declared bankrupt. So this is called a financial distress cost. The likelihood of the company becoming bankrupt increases. This is why you have seen that that company which is levered, haven't you seen in the last example, levered beta is more than the unlevered beta. And not only that, those companies whose debt is more, their levered beta is even more and that leaves the gap between levered and unlevered beta huge. Yeah. So this invites the systematic risk high. This makes a systematic risk high. So if you are saving some money in the form of non-payment of tax, then your levered beta will go very high. And the capum rate of return which you must give, you see this? If a company have huge amount of debt, it can save a lot of interest payment, but then what happens? Its levered beta will go up. 
And when the levered beta goes up, because debt leads to more levered beta, and when the levered beta goes up, you end up paying more return to your investors. So you are saving tax, but then you end up paying more rate of return to your investors. So it's like a, it's not, it's not free of cost. So your minimum, the floor rate of return, which you must give to your shareholders increases because your levered beta increases thanks to more leverage. This myopic corporate finance manager was more interested in reducing its interest payments, uh, sorry, uh, uh, to, to make more interest payments and reducing its tax liabilities. But in the process, this myopic manager has ended up increasing its uh, levered cost of capital. So if you are saving via tax, you are paying more via high levered cost of capital. And plus, you are inviting distress cost. Distress cost means, uh, as I said, that uh, the probability of the corporate bankruptcy go up if you are borrowing recklessly. So therefore, an important question before a corporate finance manager is that, what should be judicious, what should be optimum uh, capital structure? What should be the most complicated, one of the most complicated job before a CFO of a company is, what should be its ideal D to E ratio? Determining this ratio, uh, determining this ratio is extremely complicated job of any corporate finance manager. Ask this any CFO, uh, how do you get your D to E ratio? It will take him ages before he could explain. It's not an easy job. Okay? Does that make sense? If you carry on a discussion, it's very important to know that we have a very important theorem uh, given by Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller, and they are the economists who won uh, Nobel Prize in economics. I don't know when, but a long time ago, they won prize, a Nobel Prize in economics. And their theorem is very important. It says that a company cannot generate its value from its liability side. A company can only generate the value from its asset side. Asset side. Assets generate value. The liability side is company's financing side. The asset side is the company's investing side. A company adds to its value from through its asset side, but never through its liability side. And they say, now can I ask you before what Modigliani and Miller say, can you see that, can you, can you give me some idea that the, a company can generate more value for its investors if it borrows more? When you see the example of Marks and Spencer paying interest before it pays, uh, before it pays tax, but the dividend will be paid after the tax is paid. Do you think that the company can make its debt holders happier by borrowing more and generate more value? Remember, I gave you an example that. A company can choose to retire its share equity, the, you know, the, 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 the ordinary shareholders, the equity shareholders, and start uh, filling the gap with more borrowings. Will it make, will it generate more value to its investors? Apparently it can, but the point I'm trying to make is that Modigliani and Miller are saying that it doesn't happen. It can never happen. The only way 
a company can generate its value is through its asset side. For them, financing is like a packaging. If I want, if you give a present to your friend on his or her birthday, uh, the present is more important than the packaging, isn't? You buy a gift, you make a, you wrapped it in a paper, you go and give the present. And the first thing this person would do, well, is that to, to rip off the package and see the present. So you, can, you can't have an expensive packaging and a very inferior gift. You always try to have a better gift and you can compromise on the quality of the paper, but you never compromise on the quality of the gift. So they give this, this, this example that financing is like wrapping paper and investing is like the main present. You can generate the value in the eyes of others through the present itself, through the present per se, not through the wrapping paper. So for them, the company's value is mobilized, is increased, is generated through its asset side and never through its liability side. This is their main hypothesis. All right, and we call it a uh, first proposition of Modigliani and Miller theorem. But I want to show you something. Uh, I come to this later on, but okay. But if you look at this slide 30, you can find that we can prove Modigliani and Miller wrong. We can provide, we can, we can prove Modigliani and Miller's theorem wrong with the very basic data. Modigliani and Miller say that, Modigliani and Miller say that a company's value cannot be generated through its balance uh, through its liability side. It's always via asset side. But if you look at this example, you will find that uh, no, it's not true. We can prove them wrong with a very basic example. Now, see this example. It's very interesting. Hypothetically, the two companies, one is U and one is L, I deliberately chose these letters. U means unlevered company having no debt. And L means levered company, which has debt. All right. And here, their starting point of comparison is same. Look at the EBIT. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax, which means operating profit. Their operating profit is same. Thousand, thousand. Operating profit is same, which means the companies are equally efficient in selling their products and minimizing its cost. So the profit that they generate through their main operations is same. Now guess what happens? The company U has no debt. Company L has debt. How much debt it has? Thousand dollars. Company L, levered company has thousand dollars debt also. And imagine the rate of interest is 8%. This company's interest payment would be zero. Can somebody tell me why it's zero? Because the company's unlevered, no debt. This company has $80, 8% 8 on thousand, not this thousand, but this thousand. Yeah, actually 8% on this thousand of debt. This thousand is different from this thousand. This is a profit, this is a debt. So you pay $80 debt. The profit after tax, PAT, no, 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 profit before tax, PBT, or the pre-tax income is thousand, this minus this is thousand, this is thousand minus 89, 20. Imagine tax rate is 34%. Tax rate is 34%. 340 is tax, 660 is the profit 
after tax pat some people call it profit after tax some people call it uh, earnings after tax uh, some people can call it net profit um, net income uh, some people can call it post tax okay anyways but look at this company 920 is a pre tax income because they have given uh, interest also 34% on 34% on 920 is this their uh, profit after tax is 607.20 now let's make a conclusion that how much a company give to its investors investors are of two types debt holders and shareholders this company gives 660 660 plus 0 to its shareholders this company gives 607.20 plus 80 687.20 to its investors this company ends up given 27.20 dollars more to its shareholders this is the additional value this company is generating this company is gen is generating 27.20 dollars additional to its value where does it come from is it coming from the asset side or the liability side liability side the value which come from the asset side is operating profit thousand thousand same no change whereas this additional value the company has generated through its liability side because if this company had not borrowed borrowed mean borrowing are always in the liability side if this company had not borrowed it would have been 27.20 dollars less like this like 660 this company has less value 660 this company has more value because this company didn't borrow this company did borrow this extra value is coming via balance sheet you can challenge modigliani and miller they won nobel prize in, in, in economics by giving this example but how can you say that financing is a wrapping paper gift is the asset no with this so-called wrapping paper we are able to produce 27.20 dollars extra which the company which unlevered fails to produce this is a counter thesis to franco modigliani and merton miller's theorem proposition all right look this is a simple example every company uh, no company is different I, i'll show you with the help of um, with the help of uh, uh, marks and spencer's data that this company is generating value with their debt yes and also uh, this 27.20 this is the extra value the company generates um, is equal to the interest to, to uh, is the interest payment because if you look um, this 27.20 is equal to 34% of 80 this 27.20 is 34% of 80 Can you check? 34% of 80 is 27.20. It means that if tax, if interest was also taxable at 34%, then this value will not be 80. It will be 80 minus 27.20. And when it is 80 minus 27.20, at the end of the process, both values would be same. So this value would be 80 minus 27.20, which would be, uh, which would be uh, 50, 2.80. And 52.80 plus 607.20 is equal to 660, the same value. So this is basically, this 27.20, there's a formula, it's 34%, which is tax rate times interest. So basically, this this 
first of all this 27.20 is called interest tax shield And this interest rate tax shield is equal to TC, uh, T subscript C, which means the corporate tax rate multiplied by uh, the interest payment, I, interest payment, TC multiplied by I. TC is the corporate tax rate, which is 34%, and interest, you know, is 80 so of $80. A dollar is $1.27.20. Interest. I can write interest. So this is PC, the corporate tax rate multiplied by uh, interest payment. The corporate tax rate is 34% and 80 is the amount of interest. So that makes it 27 point. This is the interest tax sheet. So this is basically, uh, as I wrote, the government is paying two words, um, the 34% of its interest liability, um, okay. Now I want to show you something. I want to take you back to the Marks and Spencer's, Marks and Spencer's statement. Uh, look at Marks and Spencer's income statement. How much is the interest payment? Marks and Spencer giving. How much is this? Oh, sorry, not, not here, it's the balance sheet. I need to take you back to the income statement, sorry. Yeah. Uh, how much is the company's finance, uh, the interest payment? It's a finance cost, yeah? How much is this? 113.8, yeah? Is it? And can you calculate can you calculate the company's tax rate? Is any formula to calculate Marks and Spencer's tax rate? Don't Google, don't Google corporate tax rate in the UK. No, we don't see the headline tax rate. We see the actual tax rate, which company pays. Can somebody calculate? But please tell me how much, how, how to calculate. That's more important. How can you calculate? the tax rate of Marks and Spencer. But first tell me how to, how is important than the numbers crunching, but how is more important? Hmm? Nadia? Where is 24? No, it's not income, you pay, you look at the tax. You look at what you pay. You look at the finance cost. Why would you get income in, into the picture? You pay. No, 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 no. You're going different territory. Yes, you want to say something? Oh, yes, yes. Fantastic. You have the tax amount. How much is tax amount? How much is the uh, how much is the tax you pay? And what was the profit before tax? So one twenty five point four divided by five eighty point nine. That would show tax rate. For example, uh, if I borrow from the bank hundred euros and I return 110 after one year, it means that 
I give 10 euros extra to the bank. That is the interest. But what did I borrow? 100. 10 divided by 100. 0 0.10. 10% is the rate of interest. 10% is the rate of interest. Have you got my example or not? If I borrow 100 euros from the bank last year, this year I give them 110 euros back. How much is the interest rate? Sorry? 10%. How do you calculate 10%? Okay, the difference is 10. Then is that percentage? Yeah. Divide by what? Total what? When? Now or before? Before. Yeah. So, uh, no, wait. Did I say interest rate? No, tax rate, tax rate, interest payment and tax rate. We need to calculate tax rate. What do you need here? Look at the formula, Nadia, at the board. You need tax rate multiplied by interest. Interest is visible there. Interest is visible. Interest is visible in pounds. And how much is this? Well, it's 20, it's 113.8. So if I can write, uh, let me write on the spreadsheet so that it's visible to you. So in this example, your interest, interest is 113.8, right? Million pounds, but we don't care about it. But then we have profit before tax. The profit before tax to, to Marks and Spencer is 580.9. And so 580.9. And the tax it pays is uh, 125.4. 125.4. But this, these are the amounts. This is a tax payment, not the tax rate. Tax rate would be would be tax divided by the profit before tax is 21.58. So I can say that Marks and Spencer is paying 21.58% the tax rate. Mm -hmm. Can I say so? How do you calculate interest tax shield? Interest tax shield is equal to the corporate tax rate the company pays multiply by the interest payment. Okay, so the tax rate, which is TC here, times times the amount of interest it pays. Oh, sorry. Twenty four point five seven. This company, Marks and Spencer, is able to generate twenty four point five seven million pounds of the value, which would have been missing if Marks and Spencer had no debt. Where are Modigliani and Miller now? And here, this, this number you have only generated because of financing matters. Financing means the issue between debt and equity. This additional value Marks and Spencer is able to produce is, uh, on the basis that uh, this company has, you know, uh, has borrowed. Okay, good or not? understood or not is very important
to know the concept and also apply in the real life situation. Now, what we do here, we go back to the, we go back to a slide. Let me see if the slide is visible, by the way. Yes, it's visible. Uh, we have a concept in finance called perpetuity. Perpetuity. We have a concept called annuity. Annuity and perpetuity. They look funny names. But the annuity is that, uh, for example, if you get some annual return, fixed return, for certain time, it's called annuity. For example, uh, you deposit your thousand euros in the bank and the bank says that I would pay you 8% till you keep money with the bank. Mm -hmm. And let's say the agreement is that you would be keeping this money in the bank, thousand euros for 10 years. And then let's say the rate of interest is 8%. It means that till the next 10 years, you would be getting 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. This is called annuity. Mm -hmm. But if you want to find this year, you got 80 euros, yeah? Because you deposited 1,000 euros last year and at 8%. Can you, be, can you be imagining, hey, what if I keep my 1,000 euros in the bank for the rest of my life? and I keep getting 80 euros every year for the rest of my life. What would be the present value of this money, this income stream, which I would be getting for the rest of my life? So let's say if you are 40 and let's say you remain till the age of 100 year, right? You are getting 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. But this question comes to your mind when you're a 40 year old, hey, imagining that I, I live for 100 years and now I'm 40, but I'm not. Neither you, <laughs> I'm just imagining somebody at the age of 40. And you know that if the rate of interest doesn't change for the rest of the life, you would be getting 80 euros each year, okay? So you may be interested at the age of 40 in knowing that what is the present value of all the money which I would be getting in the future? Present value, right? And the formula of the present value of the annuity of, a, sorry, and if this money is endless forever, it's called perpetuity. Is, is the word, the base word is perpetual. Eve, you know the meaning of perpetual? Forever. Forever, forever, non-stop. So if you assume that, you would be getting this 80 euros forever. You may be interested in knowing the present value of this income stream coming to you. And how do you find it? The formula would be. Rate of mm -hmm. The annual income divided by the rate of interest. If 27.20, if the company's capital structure doesn't change, it's D and E remain same. If the company's B and E remain same, this 27.20 would be like a per per perpetuity. It's coming all the year, rest of the life. And if the corporate tax rate also remains 34%, then what happens?
if everything remains same, if 27.20 remains same for the rest of the life, and imagining that the rate of interest will remain 8% as in this example, then the present value of all the income stream, are you getting my point actually? My point is that this situation remains same every year. Every year this company gets 27.20 more than this company. And this goes forever. Then at the end of the life, at some stage, you may be interested, hey, I'm getting 27.20 extra in 2018, 27.20 in 2019, 27.20 in 2020 and forever. What would be the present value of this extra income? The formula is this. The formula is divide the perpetuity with a rate of interest. 27.20 is something which you'll be getting, you're getting every year, divide by 8%, you get 340. The present value of this income stream, which you will be getting for the rest of your life is 340. So you make a deal with the banker that either you give me 27.20 for the whole life, or give me 340 euros, once and all, once and for all. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense or not? Look, earlier, do you remember which word I used? What was that? Does somebody remember which word I used for 27.20? Sorry? No, no, no. I use the word but for this 340 I'm using a word Debt tax shield. Debt tax shield is the present value of all the future interest tax shields. So this is a macro, is a big, big idea. Does it make sense or not? So this is this is called debt tax shield. Debt tax shield means this is the extra shield, the extra value which debt has created. If there was no debt, this value would have not been created at all. But this company is getting 340 extra because of debt for the rest of the life, not for one year, rest of the life. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know the interest rate, which, 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 <coughs> which Marks and Spencer is paying. If you look at this spreadsheet, can you find interest rate, not interest, but interest rate, which Marks and Spencer is paying? Uh-huh. Can you or can you not? <clears throat> Sorry. Can you see the interest rate here? Yes or no? Mm-hmm. Do you see interest rate somewhere? No, it's not there. There is interest, but there's no interest rate. To calculate debt tax shield, all you need is perpetuity of the interest tax shield divided by the rate of interest. You have the numerator here. Remember, you have the numerator. But what you don't have is denominator. And what would be the denominator? You have interest tax shield, but to make interest tax shield, the debt tax shield, you need the interest tax shield, which is here, divided by the rate of interest. Remember this 8%? This 8% is, this 8% is this. The problem is that you forget very quickly. Um, 
This is this 8%. 8% is the interest on debt. 8% is the interest on debt. The problem here is that we have the interest tax shield, but we don't have the rate of interest. Somebody help me. How do you calculate rate of interest? How do you calculate rate of interest? If you have the interest figure, if you have the full interest figure, which is here, uh, 113.8 in case of Marks and Spencer. So this is Marks and Spencer's data, by the way, MNS. You have the interest payment, but you want to find interest rate. Mm -hmm. But that's profit before tax. Yes. You have to divide what? You said opposite. Yes. So if you are able to divide interest payments, which we have 113.8 by the total amount of debt, pardon? Uh, that's my question. Do we have that? Where can you find debt of Marks and Spencer? In the balance sheet, where? Which side? Liability side, let's find out. Mm -hmm. So we go to the balance sheet of Marks and Spencer. Marks and Spencer, where are you? Uh, borrowing and other financial liabilities. How much are these? 30.7? Uh, what are these 30.7? Are they millions or billions or what? Mm -hmm. Million pounds, yeah. So the short term borrowings, sorry, the short term, look, these are the current liabilities, yeah. So the short term borrowings of Marks and Spencer are how much? This one? Borrowing and other financial liabilities, 125.6. Okay, let's write, uh, let's write short term borrowings. Short term borrowings, and then also write down uh, long term borrowings because for the long period, long term borrowings and then write down total borrowings the short term borrowings of marks and spencer are uh 125.6 125.6 the long term borrowings are long terms mean the non current the long term borrowings are how much is 30.7 or this what is that one Six seven zero point six. Yeah, is it so? Say yes or no. One six seven zero point six. One six seven zero point six. One six seven zero point six. And the total borrowings are. 
the short term borrowings plus the long term borrowings the interest rate would be now see the see what i do the interest payments you do divide by total borrowings it means that marks and spencer is paying 6.33 or 6.34% the rate of interest as an average rate of interest marks and spencer is paying 6.34% okay 6.34% look at the formula we have the short term borrowings we have the long term borrowings we add them we get total borrowings and then we have the interest rate we divide by the interest rate by the total borrowings we get the interest rate now you can find out get tax shield uh of marks and spencer and the formula is this the perpetuity which is this perpetuity means annually happening if we assume that marks and spencer's balance sheet would never change then for the rest of the life the present value i mean it's not that you are calculating for the rest of the life you are calculating today of the income stream which will come for the rest of the life of marks and spencer given that nothing changes in marks and spencer the balance sheet remains same if that is the case assuming then this is this divide by this there you go 387.8 and 87.75 million is the value which is the present value so if this money one year two year three year for the rest of the life the present value would be this much 387.75 this is the debt tax shield this 387 millions are generated by the balance sheet of the company not by the asset side marks and spencer have proved that modigliani and miller were wrong by giving this small exercise you are able to challenge nobel prize winner economists hmm? should we take the prize back or should we leave it let's leave it what do you think I can save it and also add to your spreadsheet so that it remains in your record. Um, what should I call it? MNS. debt tax sheet i have one more example already in similar to this in spreadsheet but in in the spreadsheets but anyways uh debt checks do you have any doubt about it any any question so let's let's have a quick recap yeah uh we had profit before tax we had tax and then we calculate the tax rate okay and then we know we could see the data income statement the company pays 113.8 as the interest and we are able to calculate here the tax rate not tax amount but tax rate and that gives us uh, interest tax shield but then we want to find not the interest but the interest rate and that's possible if we look at the borrowings of the company we saw 
the short term borrowings and long term borrowing total borrowings and then since we have the interest rate we calculate the average interest rate here we have the interest amount let's call it interest payments payments and then we calculate the interest rate and once we have the interest rate we assume that if we assume that the balance sheet of marks and spends and never change for the rest of life then we are able to find out debt tax shield which is basically this according to this formula okay uh, our today's task which we just did is a challenge you have posed to a popular theory which is the first proposition of modigliani and miller that is the balance sheet is liability side can never create value it's only the assets which create value but when you dig deep when you find the data when you have to develop your own ideas you are in a position to challenge the popular established theories right so when you are able to calculate this 340 in this hypothetical example you are able to say that this 340 dollars are generated by the company via its balance sheet not via asset side if the company had no borrowings this this number would have been missing right well that's end for the day uh,